2 Corinthians chapter 4, please. And we're going to cover some very interesting things related to the history of missions. In the history of missions, we come across the greatest missionary in the Bible, where we start out, is obviously the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, he's famously known for having four missionary journeys. He converted many parts of Asia Minor, as well as places in Europe. He tried to do Israel, but his own people rejected him. But we know that Paul, the Lord mightily used him, and he was the best forefront for Christianity today. In Paul's missionary journeys, we know that he went through a lot of trial, hardships, pain. The obvious thing to anybody, especially Americans, when you travel outside of your comfort zone and go to one new place and adapt there and start to work there, then you go to another new place, adapt there and all that, you go through health issues stress issues, environmental adaptations, and etc. It's very hard to live life that way. That's why it's very likely that he was single throughout his life. 1 Corinthians 7 kind of indicated that, yeah. that he was single. He went through pain, he was shipwrecked, he was out in the middle of the ocean in the middle of the night, I believe. But what kept him going? You ever thought about that? Which made him the greatest Christian that ever lived just recently dawned on me, and I was such a fool. I wish I knew this a long time ago. But I strongly believe what will make you the greatest Christian in the world is if you don't settle down with the world, that kind of a life. And the best thing to do that is to have that burden for missions, souls. It will dramatically change your life, your behavior, and everything. Paul in spite of the misery he went through, he kept going and he was happy. Why? Because in his mind, all he ever thought about was souls. He had a burden for the lost. People dying and going to hell. But he was very happy in his life in spite of the misery he was living at the same time. It gave him meaning. You'll notice right here in verse 8, uh, verse eight we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. But notice, the context is verse 4. In whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. See, he had a burden how the devil blinded the lost world, and they're all going to hell. Do you have a burden like that in this area? If you have that in your heart, you're going to keep going and get involved in anything that this ministry does to reach souls, to minister each other so that we can be encouraged to reach more souls out there. Do you realize how much darkness the devil has caved in and how many millions or billions are dying and going to hell? Do you know how fortunate you are to have discovered Bible-believing truth and salvation especially? What are you, a one out of how many? One out of a million? You ever thought about that? If you have that burden, that's why no matter how much pain you go through, you'll keep on going. That You're not thinking about that. You're thinking about people who are dying and going to hell rather than yourself on having a bad day. La-di-da for you when thousands are dropping into hell and burning and screaming. Poor, unfortunate you, when those souls are screaming right now in hell, huh? 
See, you have to think about that. But then verse 7, it's not just a heavy burden for lost souls, why you keep on going in spite of the pain, but verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power of, may be of God and not of us. There's meaning. There's meaning. You know why you're willing to go through suffering and pain serving the Lord Jesus Christ? Because it's fulfilling to see people getting saved. It's fulfilling to see people's lives who were used in darkness and blinded. They transform and they're happy. They're serving God. And that makes you happy. What gets you out of your pain and makes you happy is, you're finally, is when you finally stop thinking about yourself. When you think about others in their dangerous plight, their condition, and how miserable they are and their woes and their sorrows... And by the way, if you think about other people's sufferings a lot more than your own suffering, you'll realize you're not the one who's really in pain. So when you focus on that, on others, but at the same time, those others who are going through the same problems like you, you're not the only one. And who are going through worse problems than you. But God transforms their life and they get saved from hell. And God patches their home, patches their broken lives, yeah. gives them Bible-believing truth and their eyes open. You become happy. Yeah. Why? You're not thinking about yourself here, yeah. about your comfort, yeah. your happiness, your uh, preferred money situation, financial stability, housing situation. What really makes you happy is you get out of yourself and finally think about others. When you do that, it gives you meaning. It gives you happiness. It gives you something thrilling, exciting, worth living for. It's amazing that in spite of a nearly 40-hour flight back from Africa and third world conditions, and yeah, I drank the wrong water, so I was sick the entire flight. And in spite of... Uh, how much tiredness me and my wife went through, my goodness, we were so happy still because of so many little kids and people whose hands reached out and they just grabbed the tracks that we were giving. And that made the flight worth it. That made the pain, you know, that made that pain out of there because of what I did, what I accomplished. It's amazing what getting out of yourself can do when you think about others and you find fulfillment when somebody who's in the dark, who's in the need, who's spiritually hungry, you receives light and receives wow. happiness. It gives you meaning. It gives you meaning. So we understand that from Paul's first missionary journeys. But then, throughout Rome's compromise... Rome started to mingle with Christianity. You know those Christians? They were spreading the gospel everywhere because of that silk route. That silk route made them travel through all parts of the world from Antioch. Antioch was the headquarters of Christianity. Uh, there are even stories that it reached all the way to China, maybe Korea, maybe Korea that time. Some stretch it as far as Japan, which I'm not sure if it's true or not. But the reason why it was able to spread out is because they had the silk route. And Rome could not stop Christianity. They even persecuted them, burned them at the stake, nailed them on crosses. Children and women were torn apart by lions, but it couldn't stop the fire. Why? When you have that fire for lost souls, it gives you meaning in life. And it doesn't make you think about whatever pain you're going through. That was an unstoppable fire that Rome couldn't solve. But how it solved it was through compromising. The big key that killed everything was compromise. So Rome compromised with Christianity. And after that came the horrible, monst monstrous Roman Catholic Church. It wasn't called Roman Catholic officially with official popes and full-blown Catholic doctrines that we see today. But it was growing through the church fathers and through Roman leaders who mingled with Christianity. Now, 
You know what happened through this compromise? What happened through this compromise and how Satan doused the fire was because of head knowledge. Well, I know doctrine. I know doctrine. You know, they, you can get so deep into right doctrine that you lose the fire for missions. So it's not just compromise. The second issue that killed missions was head knowledge. You want an example? We believe in the basic doctrine called the Trinity. That's pretty obvious. But do you know how deep the church fathers went into to debate about the Trinity? Over stupid, nitpicky stuff. So, so much in stupidity, in nitpicky stuff, that they started to critique and call some people heretics and separated from their own brethren over stupid issues regarding the Trinity. Well, how, how stupid was it? It was incredibly stupid that they would accuse them of being Jehovah's Witnesses when they weren't Jehovah's Witnesses. Of denying the deity of Jesus Christ when they didn't deny the deity of Jesus Christ. It was so stupid that if you study the doctrine of the Trinity, it goes so deep, it's actually, who cares? So, it went full-blown deep that now there's even... Uh, uh, so many different terminologies, Arianism, great, uh, gradational level versus um, subsidiary levels and blah, 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 blah. It was so stupid that it went to a point, now they're debating, and still today, it's not really well known, but it's, they're debating today if Jesus is really subservient to the Father for all eternity. And if you believe in that, then you're a heretic or full-blown Arianism Jehovah Witness if you're not careful. Now, who cares about that, all right? We believe Jesus is God, the Father is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. We believe the Son is subservient to the Father, but they make it a big deal. If you make it where he's subservient to the Father for all eternity, you make him lesser God. So see, that's like Jehovah Witness, you know? You believe he's a lesser God. Shut up! But that's what happens, see, when you get nitpicky on a right doctrine. Now, doesn't that sound like us Bible believers? What happens after that, then you take advantage of right doctrine, listen, and you can become, you can go deeper into that, that what happens with this head knowledge, you become abusive in power. And then you think that you're the real Bible believer around and everyone should follow what you're doing. And they want a big name for themselves. I'm the next Jack Kyles. I'm the next Peter Ruckman. Right, right. And then what they do with that power, because they have the control over right doctrine, and they nitpick so deep into that, then they cut off their fellow Bible believing brethren. Ah, <laughs> do you see? What men learn from history is what? And don't we see that repetitive pattern? But this is first centuries, man. How come stupid Christians never learn? And incredibly stupid Bible believers as well. And then what happens is you will eventually teach wrong doctrine when you do that. You nitpick on the right doctrine, you eventually teach wrong doctrine. Then, with that abusiveness and wrong doctrine, you become to a point where with that abuse, abusiveness, your practice becomes wrong. Sins come out, wrong spirit. Why do you think the popes had so much corruption, scandals? Why do you think from Hiles these sad cases happen with their pastors, for example? And it's getting to, yeah, give, give time, because history repeats itself. It's going to happen to our crowd one day. Yeah, amen. I'm going to take a long time if I keep parking it right here. But you see this repetitive pattern? The Bible believers those days knew better. And they're like, not getting into that head knowledge stuff. And they're like, we got to think about the lost souls out there. So Nestorius came to the scene. And none of the, oh, the people during the early centuries would get their doctrines right because we don't blame them because the reason why is they didn't have the whole word of God in their hand that time where they can study because all that time was manuscripts, right? 
and the passed along through oral tradition. See how reliable that is, all right? You can slip in wrong teachings given enough time with information passed upon different information. But during that time, they did the best that they could. And the best that they could people that time, we see one example was Nestorius. And Nestorius, the, the, he was disowned and separated by official church fathers who wanted the title for themselves as doctor, yeah. to be known as the next Jack Clowes or Peter Ruckman and etc. And they nitpicked on the doctrine of the Trinity, on the deity and the humanity of Jesus Christ, and then call Nestorius a heretic, but most historians and theologians will agree that even though Nestorius was in the wrong and he was controversial, that it was still politicized and the church fathers did it all for political power. All right, that's, uh, that's currently our Bible-believing crowd, it looks like. They want to get the name and become, you know, the next guy and then control people through that. And then give it time with that flesh as you abuse. That flesh has no limits, and you're going to be caught with wrong spirit and certain sins, and God forbid a scandal. All right, what men learn from history is that men never learn from history. Anyway, Nestorius knew better. He was trained from Antioch, Syria. Got his people going. Because he was kicked out by his brethren, who cares? That's what evangelism does. You spread out the gospel. All right, you get rejected by your crowd, you go concentrate on another crowd who will accept you and just spread it out around the world. And that's why these stupid church fathers, they were like dead Calvinists and dead Bible believers. Excuse me, um, okay? Forgive, forgive me for giving that comparison because it's really true. Studying books and all day debating about stupid doctrinal stuff. And oh, Augustine is such a good guy. How many tracts did he pass out? Okay. How many souls did he win to Jesus Christ? Okay. These deadbeat idiots. And all they did, without a burden for so what good is all that doctrine if you don't spread it out? Yeah, yeah. So Nestorius and those guys, they were spreading it out while these church fathers were saying, I'm the real Bible believer. I'm the guy that you should look up. I'm the real Christian. I'm the doctor. Blah, blah, blah. Who stinking cares? You, did, you hardly led a soul in your life while these, while the Nestorius and the Nestorians, they were spreading it out. And they were reaching Muslim countries before Islam came in. And there were thousands getting baptized, thousands of Nestorian churches planted, reached all the way to China and even Korea. That's how the Lord mightily used them to spread out Christianity. They, you know what they were doing? They were following what their ancestors did, following the Silk Route. They followed the Silk Route, and they were able to make it all the way there. The other one is, while those church fathers were arguing stupid stuff about doctrine all day long, here comes Patrick in Ireland. And Patrick in Ireland, he was up against those Druids. I mean, those Celts, you've seen the Stonehenge, satanic stuff going on. But he went against them, and he was known as the more powerful Druid than those Druid priests. That's what those, Celtics, those Celts saw him as. And he spread the gospel, and then one many to salvation and Patrick just kept planting churches and he kept on going Euphilus was the other one one of the earliest evidences of manuscript for your Bible is the Gothic Bible thanks to Euphilus the Goths were the one who changed Roman culture that time when the Goths came in Rome was losing its power it was mingled with barbaric tribes Goths are a major bunch of that, before Roman Catholicism came in. But God used Euphilus where he was translating his Bible, and that was able to spread abroad through all the Goths. As a matter of fact, even pagan Goths were, had access to Euphilus' teachings and Bible because of that. That's how pervasive and God used it. The other person that God mighty, mightily used was Columba. Columba went to Scotland, and the king would not allow Columba to come inside. But Columba prayed outside of the city's gates until the Lord answered his prayer and the king kept seeing him pray day number one, day number two, and a long time. And the, the Lord smote the king's heart and then the king let him in and Columba gave the gospel over there. Spread the gospel in the British Isles that time in Scotland. The Lord was mightily spreading out his gospel while these church fathers were saying, I'm the next Jack Isles. I'm the next Peter Ruckman. I'm the one you all should follow. Anyone who doesn't agree the way I do things with my own church, with my own way, you're separated from me. When you do that, then the brethren that God will use who are separated from them will spread the gospel while you're not. 
So here goes Patrick, Euphilus, Columba, and Nestorius during the early centuries. Then, though, then the Protestant Reformation came in. Roman Catholicism won with its uh, darkness and empire spreading. And then Martin Luther came to the scene with the Protestant Reformation that changed everything. The problem, however, with uh, Martin Luther's Protestant Reformation is that deadbeat head knowledge again. And then in came the Calvinists. And the Calvinists came to the scene. And then that head knowledge just, just made a dead gospel from spreading because they believe that God elected that certain people to get saved. So why bother you reaching them with the gospel? Because God will reach them. Here goes the deadbeat Calvinist due to the Protestant Reformation. And then guess who took advantage of that? The Jesuits. They came in with their counter-reformation to attack the Protestant Reformation. And they spread out missions. Where the Christians failed, the devil's crowd took advantage of that. The Jesuits sent in their missionary through Francis Xavier, Matteo Ricci, and others. Nestorians did such a pervasive work that for centuries long, the Vatican tried to send out missionaries over there, but they paled in comparison to the Nestorians. When the Nestorians came in, one person came named Alapen, and he had what the Buddhists call sutras or scriptures, but it was 27 in number. Can you guess how many books are in your New Testament? Makes you wonder what they were. Alapen came into the scene and Taoists and Buddhists attacked and want, didn't want Christianity to spread, but Alapen Wan, the ruler, allowed him access and there, and there they were able to plan out churches and spread the gospel over there. As a matter of fact, Genghis Khan, when he came to the scene, he married Nestorian princesses, and through his conquest of different nations, he, un he unconsciously, unknowingly spread out Nestorian Christianity. So for centuries, the Roman Catholic Church was at a setback, but due to the deadbeat head knowledge of these, of, of these Calvinists, and etc., the Jesuits were able to finally take over and put a foothold into the country. Another fall that you're going to notice right here, and this is why balance is so important, is remember, it's not just head knowledge that's the problem, it's what? Compromise. Unfortunately, Nestorians compromised and mingled with the Buddhist culture. So because of that, their movement eventually died out to extinction, and when the Jesuit missionaries came in, no signs of Nestorianism. Why? Because when, that, when your church becomes a part of the world's culture, okay, come on. see that doctrine is not emphasized, preached, and taught. So it's eventually going to die out and be replaced by culture. Right. That's why it's so dangerous when your doctrine compromises with culture. When there's a, comprom when there's a compromise of doctrine. But there's also a danger of head knowledge. It makes you to a point where you become abusive of it and nitpicky on stupid things and then separate and divide the body of Christ more and you die out. And you become more nitpicky in right doctrine, you will eventually teach wrong doctrine. And before you teach wrong doctrine, you're going to be living your life in wrong ways, in the wrong spirit. That's going to come out first before you teach wrong doctrine. When you emphasize so much and get it deeper into right doctrine and then uh, anyway, so see that, that balance is important. What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. But anyway, when we continue on, Jesuits spread out. They reached China. They even reached Korea. And unfortunately, in spite of persecution in Korea against the Catholics, those Catholics survived and continued. But the Christians, they didn't. The Bible believers didn't. Why? Due to compromise of doctrine. Doctrine is very important. The Calvinists actually, believe it or not, there were Dutch Calvinists that got shipwrecked all the way up to Jeju Island, Korea. Two of them. Two of them. God did it twice, but no mission movement. Why? 
Because they're Calvinists. They hardly do evangelism work. See that? See that? But thank God there was another branch from the Protestant Reformation. There were a bunch of Lutherans who were known as pietists. And they couldn't stand the deadbeat work. They believed in spreading out an evangelism. And they were called heretics by their own crowd who were nitpicky on head knowledge and doctrine. When you get that, you must be in the right crowd then if you're focusing on evangelism. See that? See that there? The pietists, they were called heretics. They were called false Lutherans. And uh, they, were to they were disowned by their own crowd. But the pietists had a burden for souls and evangelism. And they wanted to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were called priests of Baal. <laughs> they were called dangerous people. Kind of sounds like us, right? Kind of sounds like us. But they had a burden for souls. Eventually, the Lord mightily used this other branch from the Protestant Reformation. And it eventually reached the schools. It eventually even reached the noble rulers. And because of that, that's why even the people themselves, the believers, started to be influenced by the pietism spirit of spreading the gospel eventually. It reached the Moravian people and a significant rich person who was influenced by the pietists was Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf. Zinzendorf was a part of royalty, very wealthy man. Uh, owned lands, estates, had a lot of money. But Zinzendorf, when he was school, when he had an encounter with pietists through the schooling system, and other places, his heart had a burden for uh, reaching and evangelizing people. He became part of an association called Order of the Grain of Mustard Seed, a Christian fraternity committed to loving the whole human family and to spreading the gospel. The Lutheran pietists who were uh, mainly responsible were... Uh, Frank, and uh, let's see if I can find the other one. Philip Jacob Spenner and August Hermann Frank. Those are the two main people from the pietists that started it out. Zinzendorf was influenced by Frank. In the end, he kept on going for the Lord. And there was a painting that he viewed that changed his life forever. And he started to give his money to missions. He, even from his estate, he sent out Moravian missionaries. It was a painting with Jesus enduring a crown of thorns with an, with an inscription that read, all this I did for you, what are you doing for me? Because of that, people who were suffering persecution by the Roman Catholic Inquisition, Zinzendorf, they fled to Zinzendorf's estate. Zinzendorf uh, gave them a a family living situation, but these Moravians, they were not content to stay at their homes. They had a burden to spread the gospel to other places. As a matter of fact, their whole lifestyle and li living was that according to this book, this is from Jerusalem to Arian Jaya by Tucker. It's a book about missions. It's a very good book. The author writes, the Moravian missionaries were single-minded. Their ministry came before anything else. Wives and families were abandoned for the cause of Christ. Young men were encouraged to remain single. And when marriage was allowed, the spouse was often chosen by lot. So I'm, I know that's pretty extreme. I'm not saying that we practice that. But the point is, is that these people, they made sure that their very own living and everything, their careers, was involved with as when it connected with spreading the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Another one right here was all of his missionaries, that's Zinzendorf's missionaries, were lay people who were not trained as theologians, but as evangelists, okay. as self-supporting laymen. They were expected to work alongside their prospective converts, witnessing their faith by the spoken word and by their living example. 
always seeking to identify themselves as equals, not as superiors. See, very different from the church fathers, those head knowledge Calvinists, etc. Their task was solely evangelism, strictly avoiding any involvement in local, political, or economic affairs. Their message was a love of Christ, a very simple gospel message. They made sure that the jobs that they chose, the schools when they were going to undergo, and the marriages that they were going to choose, it would all connect to spreading the gospel. How's your American lifestyle when you choose your marriage, when you choose to raise your family, when you choose your job, when you choose where to live? See that? That's why those Moravians were the real deal. As a matter of fact, um, Leonard Dober, I believe that's his name, the first Moravian missionaries who went out, they heard that, that there were slaves in the Caribbean islands and they had a burden to reach those souls. So they heard that in order to reach those slaves, they must become slaves themselves. So it was said that Dober and his friend sold themselves to a master to become slaves themselves. And as they went on their ship, and the brethren were waving goodbye to them. Uh, Dober and his friend cried out victoriously. Uh, and let me get out that quote before I don't do it justice. I forgot to pull out that quote. But it was very touching uh, what they said about being sold off as slaves. The very first Moravian missionaries. It's... Uh, Pretty touching. Let's see right here. I got the quote. As the boat pulled away from the shore, Dober lifted his hand up to heaven. And remember, they, it is said that they sold themselves as slaves. He cried out, May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. Wow. That was good. Wow. Can you say that? I know why. You're comfortable. You're already adapted to this lifestyle in this area. You know what a missionary mind is? See, it's not stuck in one area, adapted, uh, normalized in this culture. Do you understand why this pastor preaches very hard against this culture? Do you remember that? The reason why is I believe when we're stuck in this localized culture, it influences our flesh. It meets all of our fleshly preferences, what we're used to living. It's very dangerous, that thing. We got to get out of that. We got to be active. We got to learn to adapt to new situations, to suffering, okay. new trials that come up, and find fulfillment while doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And the only way that can do that is that if you have that mind like Paul about a burden for souls who are lost in darkness and you find fulfillment in other people's happiness. So the Moravians were the real deal. Then you get uh, Christian David and Hans and Getty who were able to reach all the way to the Eskimos. They traveled by sea from Europe all the way to, <laughs> to the Americas when America was hardly getting planted by that time. Up to Greenland and then up to where the regions were, where the Eskimos were at. And they were able to spread the gospel. Christian David, he, he lived his life helping persecuted Christians during the Roman Catholic terror where he was able to help them escape and find refuge in Zinzendorf's estate. But he wasn't content living his life there. And he, in life in solace and comfort, finally, from persecution, he says, no, there are lost souls out there that need to get saved. And then he left his land and then started ministering to those Eskimos, giving them the gospel of Jesus Christ. George Schmidt reached all the way down to Africa. As he reached down to Africa, one of his first labors uh, that helped him immensely fell back into drinking and to sin. His church was so small, he hardly got anything done for the Lord. There was, a old, there was a lady he was able to get baptized and give her a New Testament Bible. Then, unfortunately, he had to be called back, and he had to leave his small, fledgling church 50 years. And unfortunately, he couldn't go back there to minister to them and died. But 50 years later, when the Moravians came back, they thought that there was no church, but they were surprised to see an elderly woman with the New Testament in her hand. I was the one who was baptized by him. 
and I still got this New Testament in my hand that I'm reading. Arabians were the real deal. They spread out missions that time. Praise the Lord, the gospel was spreading out. It was reaching uh, parts of Africa, and it was reaching the Americas. As the, uh, as the Americas was getting ministered to with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what happened. The Great Awakening revivals came in. And as the Great Re Awakening revivals came in, and they were spreading out all the fruits, the native Americans there, they were called Indians that time. They, some people still do, but that's politically incorrect, so I don't know anymore what you call them, all right? But anyway, I'm just going to use them interchangeably. But in North America, now those natives, they had to be ministered unto. David Brainer had a burden for those natives, and John Elliott was the first one to minister to those natives. As he first came in and they started to colonize America, it was still fresh. The natives, here they were, us going into the town, but none of the white so-called Christians ever gave them the gospel. So John Elliot, as he was finally living his dream life in America, settling in for years and years, finally he got a burden on his heart. Somebody's got to minister to those natives. So he went out, preached his first message, and those natives rejected him. They weren't interested in his preaching. Fell back, came back defeated, but he was determined. Just like your soul winning, right? Worked hard, kept improving his skill, went to preach to them again, and this time those natives were interested. And then they listened to him. He was able to give the gospel, and the thing that bothered him the most is that the natives who were so interested in the gospel, into the Bible, asked him, why didn't, the, why didn't your fellow white people told us about this a long time ago? David Brainerd, he was successful. Uh, I think uh, it was at Yale. I'm not sure, or it was Princeton, but it was an Ivy League school that time where he was a successful student, but David Brainerd even surrendered all of that at a very young age, I think at the age of 18. He was a teenager to the mission call, the mission field, and ministered to the natives. He would pray all night, and if you read his diary, it's amazing what kind of sufferings he went through. He would pray so hard that the snow would melt around him when he prayed. He prayed all night one time, and then even though he wasn't sweating drops of blood, he was sweating profusely. And when he went up, and then he went to preach at those natives who were doing their pagan celebration, they all of a sudden stopped, and they felt like the power of God was in him, and they listened to him preaching. He was engaged to Jonathan Edwards' daughter, but never married. He died at an extremely young age, in his 20s, just for what? A burden for souls. Burden for souls. That's how the gospel was spreading for the Lord Jesus Christ during that time. So many missionaries gave up their uh, lifestyles just for the call. William Borden, he was a graduate of Yale University, but he left one of his family's greatest family fortunes. Why? To become a missionary to China. What a waste of life. But in spite of that, he started to minister, and he wanted to do the work of the Lord. He got as far as Egypt and died of cerebral meningitis. So couldn't be that missionary in China successfully. And by the way, he was only in his 20s. What a waste of life. But in the end, his last words were, no reserve when he gave up his worldly possessions. The second line, no retreat. That means in spite of the lack of fruits, he wouldn't go back. He kept going. And when he died, he wrote, no regrets. No reserve, no retreat, no regrets. That's William Borden, died in his 20s. Standard Oil Company, they offered an enormous sum of money to a mission, another missionary in China. And they said, you know, come over here and help us. But the missionary turned them down. They doubled the salary offer. <laughs> now, this is a Standard Oil Company, all right? Connected to, you know, Rockefellers that time, who was, one of, who was probably the richest guy that time. So he was going to be wealthy. But the missionary, in spite of a double portion of salary, turned that down. Again. 
So then they asked him, what do you want? We can't give more money than that. You know what that missionary replied? The money doesn't have anything to do with it. The job is too small. Did you get that? You know what the high calling is? Not a double portion of your salary and then you make a living and you get a name. It's what you're doing right now. When we read the bulletin, how many tracts were passed out? How many souls were won? Now, how many of you are going street preaching? How many of you are taking the tracts and passing them out? How many of you are soul winning? Henry Martin, he was a distinguished scholar, Cambridge University student, honored at only 20 years of age for his achievements in mathematics. Unheard of. But you know what? He felt an emptiness inside. He said that, quote unquote, only grasped a shadow. That's what he felt like. He only grasped at shadows. But then he evaluated his life's goals again. See, goal, right? Motivation. He realized that uh, it was souls. It was souls again. So when he switched his purpose in life to souls, then it became an eye-opener to him. And then as he entered the mission field, and Martin, he stepped into India, and as he stepped in there, he gave one quote to God at the age of 24, only at the mere age of 24. Lord, let me burn out for you. Next seven years that preceded his death, he translated the New Testament into three difficult Eastern languages. <laughs> Next seven years that preceded his death after that. Can you imagine that? Lord really burned him out. Those notable achievements were certainly not passing shadows. India, you can see how many souls were dying and going to hell, how the God of this world had blinded them. So not only in China, you go to South Asia and India, and there were women throwing their babies to the Ganges rivers because they think that's where they can receive forgiveness of sins and they can offer sacrifices. One woman, she actually did that. And when she, she was sobbing and she was heartbroken, she, her name was Alila, and she clung on to her baby, loved the baby so much, and then all of a sudden threw her baby into the Ganges River. And she started to wail uncontrollably after that. Then a missionary approached her, sawing her saw her weeping and wailing, and then told her and asked her what her condition was. And she told him, that the problems in my home are too many and my sins are heavy on my heart. So I offered the best I have to the goddess Ganges, that's the river, my firstborn son. The missionary was heartbroken, witnessed to her about the gospel of Jesus Christ, about how J Jesus can love her and her sins can be forgiven through him. She looked at him strangely and said, I have never heard that before. Why couldn't you have come 30 minutes earlier? If you did, my child would not have had to die. William Carey was a poor man just making shoes, but he had a burden for the lost. And his fellow Christians, deadbeat Calvinists, told, discouraged him to go. Some of them even said that paganism should, uh, some of them, even said that the people in India, they deserved the hardships that they had due to paganism. But Kerry had a burden, and when he was teaching geography to a geography class, and then he used his pointer and pointed out different countries, tears welled up in his eyes. And he would, said, and he would say, in this place, there are people who never even heard the name of Jesus before. So he went to India. His wife went insane, and the wife never was a supporter for him in his ministry. He went through hell. He lost several children, but he kept on going for the Lord out of a burden for the lost, and he found fulfillment 
in winning souls in India. He became known as the father of missions, father of modern missions. He deserved that title. Gowans, Walter Gowans, who was the founder of SIM, and that's the that's a location in Africa that's known as Sudan Interior Mission. Walter Gowans had a burden to reach the lost over there in Africa. As he went down over there trying to win the lost, we, re we press rewind into his life, and there was a mother. A mother who had a burden for lost souls. A mother who believed that the Lord called her son into missions. And just a quiet little Scottish lady. And then she pointed out, uh, she believed that God had called her eldest boy, Walter Gowans, to the Sudan. It was known as Sudan at that time. When uh, Gowans, Walter Gowans, grew up, he died in Sudan. I believe it was due to malaria. When the missionaries came back to the mother of the deceased son, she actually told the missionary, well, I would rather have had Walter, that's her son who died as a missionary, who believed that her son was called to be a missionary. She said, I would rather have had Walter go out to the Sudan and die there all alone than have him home today disobeying his Lord. No, we're not living real Christianity, folks. No, your life is not really suffering for Jesus Christ. I think we should word things carefully when we talk about our own woes and sorrows. We don't really understand that. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not putting that down. I go through my woes and sorrows, and I tell you that. You guys go through that, and we pray for each other. We empathize. We don't judge you. But I don't want us to normalize it. Do you understand? Normalize it to our cultural level, our cultural understanding of what real suffering is. You don't know, and I don't know that. Until you get out of this place and do something. Hudson Taylor, he was mocked by his fellow Christians as usual. Due to head knowledge and their own ways of what Christianity is. No different from today. Because he was thinking about the Chinese culture. He even had a pigtail, dyed it black. But, oh, you know, that's unchristian or whatever. But Hudson Taylor had a burden for the Chinese people. He lived his life a lot of times in depression because that's what happens when you're in a new lifestyle, when you separate from all comforts. Uh, the wo woman he was engaged to separated from him. So he gave up a lot for the Lord Jesus Christ. But as he was going through the test of people who want to be a missionary alongside him in, in China, he heard a lot of different answers. He asked them, why do you wish to go as a foreign missionary when he tested one? Some of them would say, I want to go because Christ has commanded us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Another one was, I want to go because mil millions are perishing without Christ. A lot of people gave different answers. Taylor said this out of experience of his depression and suffering and everything. All of these motives however good, will fail you in times of testings, trials, tribulations, and possible death. There is but one motive that will sustain you in trial and testing, namely, the love of Christ. No, I don't think we understand the love of Jesus Christ as much as we should. There was another missionary in Africa who asked if he liked what he was doing, you know what the response was? It was very shocking. Usually Bible believers, when they say, I will not trade this work for the world, right? And I meant that, too, and I mean that too. But this missionary said, no. <laughs> and the people were shocked. He said, my wife and I do not like dirt, as they were ministering in Africa. We have reasonably refined sensibilities. They have a taste for luxury. We do not like crawling into vile huts through goat refuse. Nobody likes poop, right? But is a man to do nothing for Christ he does not like? 
God pity him if not. Liking or disliking has nothing to do with it. We have orders to go and we go. Love constrains us. As Taylor kept uh, interviewing a lot of people who were, who want to go in the mission field, in came a person with only one leg, a one-legged school teacher from Scotland. And then Taylor, as he was interviewing everybody, and then came this one-legged person, and Taylor asked him, with only one leg, why do you think of going as a missionary? George Scott, the, the, the famous George Scott, who we, later know later on, uh, who we know later on as a missionary who did some mission work in China, replied to Hudson Taylor, I do not see those with two legs going. That's why. He got accepted. I trust all of you have two legs. How many aren't going? Well, let me tell you then. Then God will use third world people to do it if you're not. I know of Filipinos who are going out as missionaries, believe it or not. Why? You Americans aren't. The gospel was spreading out through South Asia, Asia, and uh, South America, Africa, North America. The gospel was spreading out. It, it even reached the Pacific Islands, where there was witch doctor, cannibalism. John G. Patton came to the scene, and then those th there were three witch doctors who put curses on him. But John G. Patton dared them on. He didn't flinch. And... They tried their curses and spells on him, kind of like Patrick, what he went through in Ireland against the Druids. But their curses didn't work on him. And the people thought, man, this guy must be God, must be a holy man. But John G. Patton simply replied, no, it's because my God is more powerful than your God. In the end, he was able to win a lot of them to Jesus Christ. In, this became such a mighty testimony that Charles Darwin who thought that that particular population that John G. Patton was ministering to was so low in the process of evolution that when he came back, he was so shocked. Here they were civilized, singing hymns, able to read, having the Bible to themselves, that he even sent a large, generous donation to John G. Patton's society and mission. You know what that is? That's mission. You know what that is? That's fulfilling in life. That's being a good testimony to the lost people, too. That's something. How about you? How are you doing, huh? The gospel was spreading out. Now, you notice one place where it's not reaching. Did you notice one place? It was re spreading out everywhere. Including South America. You get Jim Elliott, who flew in over there. And then he had a burden in... I believe it was Ecuador, to reach those people, the so-called savages there, to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But they killed him. They killed him, and what could the family do? Well, they had no choice, right? They had to go back home, and they, they can't do anything about it. Nope, that's not true. As a matter of fact, what happened is that Elizabeth a Elliot the wife of the husband who got killed, and then I believe the missionaries, uh, another missionary who died there, who was killed by those people there, his sister, they both went down to the same place, to those same murderers to try to give them the gospel. You know, she was even carrying her baby, and there were fellow believers who told her that it wouldn't be a good idea to go. But you know what? She believed with that baby in her back. I mean, she was in danger. You got to realize she was in danger of her getting killed and her baby being sold off. But she said, quote, as long as this is what the Lord requires of me, then all else is irrelevant. She went down there and those people got saved. The ones who murdered her husband got saved. No, we don't understand real Christianity. When we have family, when we have kids, then we settle down with the world, don't we? 
and we forget about our burden for lost souls and ministering to people. We have to examine ourselves. The Moravians, when they made life decisions, now look at yourself, certain life decisions you made besides salvation, okay? Besides coming to this church. In every life decision you made, did it have to do with spreading the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, spreading Bible-believing truth? See, even your regular job career. Me, I was prepared to drive for Uber and Lyft, but still try to be a witness to those people and use the money to support the church to spread out missionaries. That was all I had in mind. Supporting family is just part of it to spread the gospel. Do you understand? Marriage decision. That's why I didn't get married for years. You know that. Why? I don't want anything to hinder this ministry. She knew that. I didn't decide to marry her. Listen, I didn't say yes to her just because she's a pretty girl. Everyone, including, I guess, people in this church were like, were like, marry the girl. I was the last one to make that decision. But I needed to know because I know how painful this ministry is. And I knew that she, I don't want her to be miserable. She said, when I told her, look, you're leaving everything that you have and you're going to be miserable because we're not talking about pastoring just in America where it's a different culture for you. So that's difficult, number one. People you don't know, number one. But number two is that this is San Francisco Bay Area. All right? That's really difficult. Ask her in the first year of her marriage life with me. See if she really likes San Francisco Bay Area especially during the rise of poverty during COVID. Third, I'm on the internet. Target me, they're going to target her. Hold her, so you, you still want to marry me. You know what she said? It's not a matter of what I want, it's a matter of what God wants. When she gave that one line, I knew no matter how different we were in personalities, or even if we would have disagreements or fights or the devil would cause any kind of disruption or hindrance in our life, that that thing that is in her heart will, and that thing which is in my heart will always bring us back together for life. For life. That's my marriage decision. There's one place, let's go back here, one place you notice missions aren't concentrated. You know why? Because that's where everything began to break from Catholicism, spread out the mission movement. That's where it began to reach England and start the Great Awakening revivals. Europe, Protestant Reformation. So where it started with its height with the Protestant Reformation, Guess what? I thought revival spreading. Oh, oh, it apostatized. Jesuits came in. Jesuits infiltrated through the universities in Europe. See that head knowledge again? Mm -hmm. Infiltrated through the universities in Europe and eventually reached the French Enlightenment. It got into French Enlightenment. Catholic Jesuit teachers were going in where atheist scholars, French Enlightenment scholars were spreading their garbage that was totally anti-Christian critiquing the word of God, reached to Germany, the heart of the Protestant Reformation, with German rationalism, then reached to England, the heart of the King James Bible, with English deism, then it reached America, the heart of the Great Awakening revivals, and hence, one by one, you cripple. Now wrong doctrine also was coming into it. Compromise. You see those two monsters? Wrong doctrine came in. They lost their final authority. Wrong doctrine was seeping in. And because of that, now let's go back to Korea, for example. Korea, they were now being, remember we left off with those Catholics there, those fledgling Catholics. Now the Presbyterians, they're a branch from the Protestant Reformation. They were able to come in, give the gospel. As a matter of fact, one person named Chalmers had a burden, and he was only at the age of 20 through 22, I believe. And he had a burden, and he reached Korea, but he was on a ship that was uh, 
destroyed by the Koreans who were scared of the Westerners coming in. And as one soldier was about to get kill uh, Thomas, I think his last name was Chalmers, he had a stack of Bibles in his suit and he picked the Bible out and he said, take this before you kill me. It's for you. The soldier killed him, took his Bible, and he actually got saved. There was something that was about to start, but at the same stinking time, revised version, wrong doctrine was being taught at seminaries, thanks to those stupid Jesuits, and then the Presbyterian missionaries who graduated from those seminaries came in and destroyed everything that could have started in Korea. They translated the first Korean Bible into the revised version. Presbyterians with their wrong doctrine of Calvinism and charismatic emotionalism mingled in and they had the Pyongyang revival which was full blown messed up. It wasn't really a revival. Jonathan Goforth who was a contemporary missionary that time to China who was doing something for the Lord uh, when he was contemporary that time. Hudson Taylor was contemporary at the time trying to send missionaries to Korea. <coughs> they were, one of his people from the mission board were able to pass out Chinese Bible in the border gate of Korea. But then these wrong doctrine missionaries ruined the whole setup. Then Yonggi Cho came to the scene, mingled, see that? Shamanism with charismatic wrong doctrine. Just like those stupid church fathers and Catholics that mingled with their culture and killed the Christian movement after that. And today, stupid, independent, fundamental Baptists, I'm not going to name names, all right, but you'd be shocked, all right, they would have the audacity to say there's a great revival going on in Korea, bogus. That was shaman, that was shaman Christianity that mingled in with the charismatic wrong doctrines. A lot of people don't know that. But you see what men learn from history is that men never learn from history. That's a, probably the best example why right doctrine should be preached. What happens? You got to be very skeptical with Korean churches now because they're going to give you the right answers because they're all Protestants. They're charismatic, see? So they're going to give you the right answers, but you ask them for their testimony. It's going to sound different. That's how you're going to find out. You're going to find out some elements of Calvinism or charismatic experience in there. The main thing is experience you're going to find out. It's not based on the word of God. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the what? Word, word of God. You're going to find that out a lot in their testimony. So you've got to be skeptical of that. So that was the evidence of uh, Christianity being ruined now, thanks to wrong doctrine. And that's why we're in this mess. Can you believe that? Where are we? Dr. Upman had a burden for uh, missions, so he had the Bible Baptist mission. So the Bible believers uh, came to the scene, and then Dr. Upman, I don't know if it's true, but it said that 80% of their offering goes strictly to missions. Started the Bible Baptist mission, and they have missionaries throughout all those areas, South America, Pacific Island, Asia, South Asia, Africa, and Europe, and uh, South America, and then some parts in North America. So the Lord was able to do that. And then you get other Bible-believing churches getting involved. He used to pastor, I believe, in Chehalis, Washington, Pastor Bill Bailey. But when you go to his church, he supports over 200 missionaries. Over 200. That is huge. So one who graduated from Dr. Upman's school was able to spread it out. And you get Jack Chick with his Chick Tracks. And that he became the world's most published author after that. He, at the beginning, he would make phone calls with Dr. Ruckman and uh, would get some theological doctrines from him. And he defended the King James Bible to a T. And the Smithsonian Institute re recognized him as the world's most published author because millions upon millions of his comic tracks were spread out through every of those areas around the world that I've discussed. Lord mightily used him. Then in uh, Korea, the Lord used my father, uh, Kyungwon Kim, where he had a burden for his Korean people, and then he called out Yonggi Cho. He called out that corrupt influence, that shaman Christianity that poisoned all of Korea. He even called out the independent fundamental Baptist pastors for their ignorance. 
for their weakness of right doctrine. See, uh, independent bap fundamental Baptists think doctrine is not a big deal. No, it is a big deal to us Bible believers. It, it damned my country. So if you don't think dispensationalism is a big deal, you're dead beat wrong. It helped me. It helped, I think it's safe to say, even the majority of my people here, save them from a lot of wrong doctrine. Even save their souls. Oh, yeah, I'm big on dispensationalism, dispensational salvation, etc. It rescues, it filters out 99% of wrong doctrine out there, pretty much. So, my dad was able to start a work, and then in Korea, praise the Lord, when, when I went down there, it was so pure, it was so pure. Finally, here is a broken group, and then my father takes them in, and then in the baptism, I was right there, praise the Lord, you get people who came in, some of them who were emotional, and they were, some of them were crying, some of them were shouting out that, and giving their testimony, and before they got baptized, they would ask their profession, their testimony, how did you get saved? Before you get baptized, how did you get saved? And they would profess, because I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for my salvation. As a repentant sinner, I called upon him, and they baptized, I saw 20 to 30 something people baptized in that river that day. My father was able to baptize, I believe, 50 or 70 people before, during his one trip. And it was spreading out through different provinces in Korea. Now Bible believing truth, the gospel was being spread for those Koreans, they had a chance. When I, uh, it, when I went to Africa, and then with missionary Dave Robinson's work. It was amazing. And before I mention about him, Campaigns for Christ is another mighty movement that the Lord has used. They've ministered to Brazil, Mexico, Africa, and Lord willing, they're going to try to reach out to Zimbabwe, Papua New Guinea, and other parts of the world. But Campaigns for Christ, they came up with a brilliant idea where Christians who are in danger of stuck in their own local area, in danger of compromise and head knowledge nowadays, the, the, the solution was to get them out and do what other missionaries do, are doing. That was the number one solution that they desperately needed. Campaigns for Christ filled in that for them. Offer them an opportunity. You pay for this much money and we'll take care of your food, boarding, and everything else. And then uh, all we're going to do is go around town, pass out hundreds to thousands of tracts, do witnessing, invite them over to the evangelism gospel campaigns. And brother and sister in Christ, it is phenomenal. I have seen it with my own eyes. And then, I praise the Lord, we get Bible-believing missionaries who came out and one great example is missionary David Robinson. Missionary David Robinson having a burden for the people in Africa. He focused on those souls down there and he witnessed, did evangelism campaigns with partnered with Campaigns for Christ. And brethren, hundreds came down on the altar during that evangelism campaign and they would have to vet them out at the same time as well. They would vet them out to make sure of their salvation. They would also vet them out to the extreme of their commitment in discipleship classes. Now, if it were any of us, we probably failed at that, right? But they went that much to the extreme, and they concentrated very heavily. At the end of the campaigns, the Lord has blessed where Praise the Lord, I was able to see it with my two eyes. And I mean, the seats were, <laughs> people were leaving their seats. And as they were leaving the seats, the ushers would stack up the chairs and clean up and pull the tents while they were traveling down. And I couldn't believe it. it was phenomenal. Over one million has now been passed out. Over one million John and Romans have been passed out for campaigns for Christ in this trip. They passed out the most material than they ever had in this recent campaigns trip in Africa with missionary David Robinson. Around, I think it was 290 something thousand John and Romans. How many people signed up for discipleship? 500. 
And then here I am, you know, away from America. You know, the San Francisco culture never left me, right? That American comfortable culture never left me. Even though I was enjoying the fruits, what the Lord did for me, and then here I did, you know, I was dehydrated. I was about to drop, but man, seeing all that rejuvenated me, kept me going. It gave me new meaning in life, full meaning in life. And I accidentally drank their tap water, which is not recommended, and was sick throughout the entire nearly 40-hour flight. But all I can think about was those souls I got, that I ministered to, those little children that I saw. And I, it meant everything in the world to me. And I was saying, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. And when I landed at the plane, I got a message from uh, missionary Dave Robinson where there were teenagers, Americans, American teenagers who joined our campaigns, and there were teenagers to little uh, early 20s, about, I think, eight of them. I got a message that they decided to stay behind. When I saw that, I was so happy. Here I was, miserable in the plane, hurting, and then, and, you know, running ill, and then just leaning on my wife. Ugh. And then when I got that message, oh, man, it was gone, and I was rejoicing, saying, thank you, God. Thank you, God! In this Laodicean age of apostasy, let's change the way we live. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. You are not even asked to go to China or to a Muslim country. Here. Here. Yet, how are you working well in soul winning? How are you living your life as the sufferings of a missionary? Really? Really? Are we repeating what church fathers have done in being nitpicky in so much doctrine that now we, if we're not careful, it's going to produce a wrong spirit, abusing its power, and falling into sinful scandals if we're not careful. Where compromise has now become so pervasive, doctrine is not a big deal anymore. And now souls are damned because of it. Because we lost its strength, its root and right doctrine. Have we become, quote-unquote, normalized by this culture we live in? I refuse. I absolutely refuse to live like this culture here. There are too many souls dying and going to hell. So many people hungry. We're so lost in our woes, in our suffering, in our sorrow, in my own need, my own need, my own need. We don't think about the billions of other needs out there. And if we would only think, and if we would only think about that, make that our life goal, oh, we would transform our very own living. Our joy would remain because we're not thinking about our own selfish, comfortable joy. Our choices in life, the careers, the decisions we make, even marriage would change, dramatically change. Do you realize, church, we are in the greatest work ever, the greatest opportunity ever? We have campaigns for Christ that we can partner with. Any of you watching, I'll put the link below, but support them. If you're attending a local independent fundamental Baptist church, sign up and apply for that. Fill it out. Send them the money. Donate to them. I'll even uh, put a link uh, to the missionary in Africa if possible. If you want to give to that, give to that one. 
the, the youth over there, they'll probably need more money to stay, so you can give to that one too. We'll try to put a link there. Give to that one. Give to missionaries. Can I assure those who are watching online that the money that you give to this church majority goes for souls? We strongly concentrate on that. Lord willing, we will soon support every missionary in Bible Baptist Mission. I'm happy to announce that. Lord willing, within a few weeks. Will you please pray about that? Praise the Lord. Thanks to your giving. Thanks to your giving. That's encouraging, isn't it? Church, do you realize that the internet that we have is reaching worldwide too? That's our silk route that the early Christians had, that the channel to carry it through. So yes, I will carry that on for the Lord Jesus Christ. Those of you who recommended our channel spread it to others, praise the Lord. Let's spread the gospel. Of course, we are not telling people to be just internet people. If you do that, then again, you're in your localized area, right? You're in your comfort zone. Get out of there. Attend a local Bible-believing church. We got a church directory there. Go out soul winning. Tell people about salvation. People in my home church here, we are... We have the greatest opportunity ever in this Laodicean apostasy. Before the Antichrist sets up his one world government and kingdom and everything's falling apart, we are in the greatest opportunity ever to spread Bible-believing truth. We're, we're spreading the internet. We partner with campaigns. We've, and wow, in one of the most liberal, wicked places in the world, this is our mission field. Stop spending time on yourself. Stop thinking about yourself. Stop making excuses. Stop thinking about what's making you un uncomfortable or comfortable or, or your suffering. There's so much work, precious work, that needs to be done. Let's pray.